very, very fine grain as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. Now I'm going to step off the lamina. That's one small step for man. The moon, so close, and yet so little known. Well, my name is Don Willingham, and I want to talk to you today about my experience with the first spacecraft that went to the moon and successfully took pictures. Temperatures 250 degrees below zero. I was growing up in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade was when space first started being talked about. And Werner von Braun was the German guy who had all kinds of space articles in him at that time, Collier's Magazine, and I just was gaga about that. And I would have never been happy if I hadn't been able to go into doing the space program. It just so happened that Purdue University started the year before I started in college, a program of engineering physics training that was made to train people who would go between the pure physicists and the practical engineers. And that was the program that I got in. And they took the top 40 applicants after their freshman year. And so I, I was really looking for that. And if I hadn't done that, I don't think I ever would have been felt complete. I had just graduated in engineering physics with a master's degree from, as it turned out, Purdue University. And I had two years of active duty because I was a reserve officer training candidate. And I had two years to do in the military. It so happened that Jet Propulsion Lab, which is a new part of NASA, interviewed at my college and they decided that I could be useful to them and they asked the military to assign me to the Jet Propulsion Lab. Ranger was designed simply to hit the moon. Before it crashed into its lunar impact point, it would send back to Earth close-up TV pictures of a portion of the moon's surface. And that had never been done before. Basically what we were doing as we are turning the camera, TV camera into a scientific instrument. Mare cognitum. The only problem was I had never taken a picture with a camera. I didn't know what ASA was, shutter speed, focal length. I mean, I really knew nothing. And my boss, who was interviewing me, said, you're just the person I want. I want someone who has no preconceived notions. Well, the first thing that seemed fairly obvious was you probably had to learn what the brightness was of the moon. If you go out and look at a full moon, you will find that it looks the same brightness all over. Well, that's kind of strange because it's a ball. And when you're over here at the side and the sun's coming in, you would think it would get dimmer. But it also turns out that in a full moon, we're looking 
essentially in the same direction that the sun is. And it so happens because of the dusty nature of the moon, most of the light is reflected back towards the sun. We have this problem of don't take a picture under full moon conditions. If you look at a quarter moon or any partial moon coverage, you will notice that the outer circular edge is bright. And as you go towards the night day line, which is called the terminator, you will see that the light level changes and gets less. And you get contrast in the scene. That means when you have slope changes, like in a crater, you're going to get brightness differences. And that's what you want. The only problem is, how close do you go to the Terminator? How sensitive is the camera? You get too close, it's going to be too dark. This is the Ranger 6, a space vehicle that's about to leave. Like any tourist, it's equipped with cameras, six of them, designed to send back 3,000 pictures of the lunar surface just before it crash lands on the moon. This is in a period of 1961 through 1965, and NASA had only been formed two years before this. Half a century ago, it's not like sticking your phone camera up and it adjusts to the brightness and makes the focus good and everything. All of these cameras were fixed. They had a fixed shutter speed, fixed f-stop, fixed sensitivity on the, on the film that would come out after it got played back and recorded. And so you're stuck. And keep in mind, the space program was where transistors got developed. I mean, transistors weren't really a big thing until the space program came along. We were using state-of-the-art transistors. And you know, you had to be really careful about them. They'd burn out and some of them would work and some of them wouldn't. Even the TV cameras that were on this, you think of the TV tubes that register the picture. RCA was building them. They had to hand select each tube because the tubes were not all that consistent a lot of the time. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. When the old days he had rabbit ears, which most of you probably don't remember, but at any rate, there were times when you get really poor reception and it would look snowy. In that kind of case, if you wanted to see something, you didn't go up and sit real close to the TV, you backed off and tried to get rid of the snow, which is called filtering. You're filtering the noise. brightness of the moon, sensitivity of the camera, and the noise. Well, I was very lucky in that about the first year after I started working, I had assigned to me a young physicist. Now I say young, I was 25, 26, he was all of 21, and a brilliant physicist, graduated from college in three years and never had a bad grade. Well, I was a research assistant early on because I was enrolled at Caltech as a graduate student and I was working there during the summer. Uh, to show you how important I was, I arrived at JPL my first day and they said, who are you? What are, what are you supposed to be doing? I said, I have no idea. I have a job here. And so Don was one of the first people I met when I finished discovering where I was supposed to go as a, a summer student coming into the lab. Don had discovered some measurements that an astronomer in Russia had taken of what's called the photometric properties of the moon. That is, if you beam the sunlight at the moon and are looking at a different angle, how does that light get reflected? And he and I together worked on this problem. 
And we decided what we wanted to do was to come up with a number that would take all these things into account and that number would basically say how small a crater would be in diameter that somebody looking at the pictures could just detect. And that number ended up being what we called a figure of merit. And it combined a whole set of issues from the properties of the television camera, the lens system, uh, the motion that was taking place as the spacecraft approached the moon, and put that together to estimate what the smallest object was that uh, could be seen in the pictures as they came back. And so it guided the scientific mission of figuring out where to impact the moon and how to do the timing so that you got there at just the right time uh, to get the pictures that you want. But we don't know one important thing, what the lunar surface is really like. Scientists, astronomers have argued, theories have been devised, and still the arguments continue. Hopefully, Rangers' pictures will be the first step toward ending such arguments. The first five Rangers failed. Well, they didn't have much of a camera system on them. They were just used mainly for testing things out. Rangers 3 through 5 had one camera and then some scientific instruments. Solar panels, an omni and high-gain antenna, mid-course motor, electronics, batteries, and the television subsystem. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition main stage. This was the first part of the civilian space program. And some of the early uh, Ranger shots were on Vanguard rockets that got slightly off the ground and then tipped over and uh, burst into flames. And uh, there were all sorts of mishaps along the way because people hadn't done this before. In fact, one of the early Ranger missions uh, was on its way to the moon and it looked like it was going to be a wonderful mission. Uh, and they had to make a mid-course correction in order to hit the part of the moon that they wanted. And it turns out there was a minus sign that was an error in the navigation program, and so it went the wrong way. The first two, they failed miserably, and they stayed up just long enough to get the spacecraft separated and to test the stable platform. Ranger 3, it separated okay, but was missing so far, and then they had the wrong sign on, on the direction. Rangers 4 and 5, the electronics failed. And what they discovered was a lot of things. One, the Air Force had changed the payload amount. And so JPL had to skimp on both the experimenters that were on board, but they also skimped on the electronic redundancy in the design. And they had really sloppy management sloppy testing techniques. And what happened in the one year hiatus between Ranger 5 and Ranger 6, 7, 8, 9 was they went back, changed their whole philosophy. One, you don't ever skimp on the spacecraft design. And that was something that was very important for the manned mission, was how did you really do things safely? Correct. And of course the mission is very complicated. It isn't just a matter of hitting the moon. You have to launch from the Earth, you have to do the transit to the moon. You have to get there at the time when the moon is rotating uh, so that the crater system or the objects that you want to photograph are in the right place. And the camera is ready to take the pictures when that happens. And so it's a time sequence that has to be worked out in tremendous detail. The management structure, I mean, heads rolled. It was not clear the management structure between NASA headquarters and the Jet Propulsion Lab. And certainly the lines of communication between the Air Force and NASA were not clear. So there are just all these things that got ironed out. And I don't know where the main impetus was the science or the engineering. Probably a little bit of both. After the year hiatus, because of all the failures, they ended up just having only camera systems on board the spacecraft. So Rangers 6, 7, 8, and 9 had six cameras. And each of the cameras was a little bit different in terms of what they would view. The A camera viewed a big area. The B camera viewed an area maybe a third that size. And then there were four cameras called P cameras 
that really viewed small areas. Tranquility. Within a few seconds of its estimated time of arrival... Ranger, as it approached the moon, had about 23 minutes to take pictures before it crashed. And those pictures had to be gathered and transmitted back before all of the instrumentation was destroyed as it hit the moon. The cameras did not operate as the Ranger landed within a mile of the target area. Five previous Ranger shoots have been failures, but it is imperative the scientists know more about the moon's atmosphere and terrain before a manned flight. Thus, high hopes go with this launch of Ranger 6, a $28 million trip of 230,000 miles. Now, Ranger 6 was the first one with a good camera system on it, and it went right where it was supposed to go. First time any of the spacecraft had come close to going where they were supposed to go. Meanwhile, the Deep Space Instrumentation Facility tracked Ranger, maintained two-way communications from Woomera and from the tracking station in Johannesburg, South Africa, processed a continuous flow of information to Pasadena. Within 90 minutes, a first rough orbit was established. Ranger would hit the moon. The only problem is the cameras they never did turn on all the way. So went all the way in, and no pictures. So, big investigation, another delay. And what they discovered was, as this thing went up through the atmosphere, probably 30 seconds after launch, there was an electrostatic discharge that turned the camera system on. Keep in mind, this was four transistors. These are high voltage tubes and all this kind of stuff. And what happened was, you can't turn on the camera system in between total vacuum and static pressure. So you had partial pressure, the arc happened, the high voltage tube burned out, and the thing was dead after the first 30 seconds. It was pretty clear that something better happened that's good real quick, or there were going to be heads roll starting at the highest level, and who knew how far down they go. So they did Ranger 7, and Ranger 7 finally worked like a charm. I mean, it was just perfect. Here in the Space Flight Operations Facility, great excitement prevailed as Ranger neared the moon, and its pictures came alive on the TV monitor. We are five seconds from full power. We have full power on F channel. Roger. look at video appears to be approximately normal anticipated strength. Video on both A and B receivers on the F channel are good. Video is very strong. Video is very clean. This is Goldstone TV Control. Now NASA could send more instrumented probes out from Earth and down to the moon to make scientific studies, to survey the terrain, to select landing areas, to prepare for the time when man himself would walk the lunar soil. And that was really exciting. I mean, the pictures were fantastic. Uh, we were involved in the process of um, enhancing and processing those pictures so that we could get the most science uh, out of the uh, photography from a geology and planetary science point of view. For each camera, there were like maybe 200 to 400 pictures. You have to keep in mind that this was when the Cold War was going on. And all of a sudden, this became a big international thing. And so NASA printed up like 300 of these boxes and sent them to all the major embassies, advertising that the United States was a peace-loving country and shared its science freely with everybody. The extraordinary pictures sent back from the successful Ranger 7 mission caused substantial modifications in earlier theories about the moon. They resulted in lunar maps and models of an accuracy and scale to within a few feet. The area within the sea of clouds which Ranger 7 photographed was renamed Mare Cognitum, the known sea. 
Ranger 8 target areas were re-evaluated according to Ranger 7 findings. It would have been much riskier for humans uh, to land on the moon if we didn't know what the texture of the surface was, how deep the dust was, and so a lot of the development of the Apollo program was actually informed by the information that we brought back. The Ranger 8 mission achieved its objectives. Not the least of these was the further qualification of the sophisticated and highly accurate guidance and command systems and of camera technology. These systems performed at their peak when Ranger 9 was launched successfully in March. As it approached the moon, it sent back from its six cameras more than 5,800 pictures of the lunar surface. Here is a speeded up sample. Ranger 9 marked the completion of the successful program managed by Jet Propulsion Laboratory for NASA. We have learned a great deal from this program for example, we know that the lunar surface within a crater like Alphonsus is remarkably similar to the surface of Mare Tranquillitatis and Mare Cognitum, photographed by earlier rangers. If firm enough, these surfaces may be suitable for the landing of the unmanned surveyor and the manned lunar excursion module. The surveyor mission was a lander so that you could see, see what the texture and how deep the dust was on the moon before you started putting men there. And so all of these unmanned missions uh, went along in parallel with the development of the Apollo program, but nobody ever heard of Ranger or Surveyor. It only got the uh, manned missions that, uh, that hit the press. So in the long run, the Ranger provided some really nice scientific information. And it was the first spacecraft that was really successful in going to the moon. There is lots of noise that is present in the pictures. The contrast isn't exactly what you wanted, even though uh, you're able to hit pretty close to where you were going. And so digital processing was basically invented to try to correct uh, some of those distortions that are present in uh, television images. And because the cameras were coming in at an angle to the surface, uh, the pictures were distorted geometrically. And so we were able in the computer uh, to rearrange the uh, pixels on the uh, resulting image so that it was as if you were looking straight down. And this was a uh, benefit from the point of view of seeing the shapes of craters, the depths of craters, and so on. By the way, I must tell you, this young man went on to do absolutely fantastic things in the internet and image processing. I mean, he was genuinely brilliant. After that, I became a, uh, an engineer and then a senior engineer, and I was supervisor of the image processing uh, group at, uh, at JPL. And that was just before I came to Stanford. I should say one of the other things that developed was the idea of mission operations. Even though things were launched from Cape Canaveral, once it got up in the air, then the control reverted to the Jet Propulsion Lab. They would pick up a telephone and talk to each other. I mean, it was that primitive. The other thing is they didn't have it closed off, so big wigs could come in in the middle of things and start asking questions. So it evolved that you know, modern type of management system in mission operations. You know, you have lots of screens and you have restricted areas and that kind of thing. So that was a development that people hadn't thought of before. The science team was very, very impressive. The uh, people who were looking at the geology, Gene Shoemaker, Harold Urey was one of the investigators who had a Nobel Prize in chemistry and uh, Gerard Kuiper, who um, dis discovered some of the farthest uh, orbiting 
uh, debris that uh, circles in the solar system. And so these were people that were world-class people, and I was a fresh graduate student uh, immersed essentially in a candy shop. Harold Urey, who got a Nobel Prize for discovering heavy water. There was Gerard Kuiper, who was head of the University of Arizona Astronomy Department, and he had discovered one of the moons of Jupiter. There was Gene Shoemaker, who was head of the U.S. Geological Survey Department in Flagstaff that specialized in planetary items. And these were guys that I ended up, at age 26, working with very closely. And they were all old. They were probably between 10 and 20 years younger than I am right now, but they seemed old. It was an exciting time. Uh, it was an innovative time. And it was absolutely exciting from a technical point. Of, of things came out of the Ranger project. I was very proud to, to be involved in that and lucky. Now me, working in my little cubby hole on this, I didn't know anything about all this intrigue going on. And there's a whole book written uh, that guy that NASA did about all the intrigue and the problems and the rewards and what have you. And I didn't know that until I read that book about five years ago. So. <laughs> Imaging continues to be one of the most uh, important and revealing parts of these space missions. Um, whether you're going to Jupiter or Saturn to see the rings, seeing the rings is what's important. Uh, if you were to fly by and only get uh, you know, measurements of the magnetism or some other abstract property, it isn't the same as seeing the lovely photographs of the rings of Saturn.